Welcome to the Insurgents Podcast with Frank Viola. And he's brought a friend. This is the podcast that supplements Frank's groundbreaking book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom, which is shaking up the Christian world. You can find out details about the book at insurgents.org. Sit back, open all four ears, physical and spiritual, and join the insurgents. Here's Frank. Welcome, welcome to another edition of the Insurgents Podcast. I'm here with my compatriot, Nikki V. We are taking your questions, and we have many pages of questions <laughs> that we want to get to in this episode and the ones to come. And so if you are one of the people who asked a question, we are going to seek to answer it as best we can. And if you didn't ask one of the questions, I think you'll find many of these intriguing. I know I did. So here's the first one. How do you respond to Jesus' specific commands to cast out demons? My first response is to react to that by asking another question, and that is, where does Jesus command all believers to cast out demons? And I cannot think of a place where he or Paul or Peter or anyone else in the New Testament commanded, now listen to the wording, commanded all followers of Christ to cast out demons. Now what I do find is that, number one, he told his disciples, meaning the twelve, on certain occasion to cast out demons. He empowered them to cast out. He sent out the seventy or the seventy-two, depending on what manuscript you use to cast out demons. So those are the only examples I can think of of Jesus actually giving a command. Now, we do have examples in the book of Acts of various disciples of the Lord casting out demons, and we do have the words of Jesus in Mark 16, which says, These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall, he gives a somewhat lengthy list, and one of them is they shall cast out demons in my name. So where I fall out on the question is, I don't think that there is a specific command by Jesus that is put on all disciples of the Lord to cast out demons. And if anybody's listening to this, you can find a specific command that that applies to me and you as a believer under the new covenant to cast out demons. I want to see it. Again, I'm talking about a command. But I do believe that all believers, all followers of Christ are empowered by the Holy Spirit and have the ability to cast out a demon, I would just say to you, having been involved in casting out demons myself, at least on one occasion, being very dramatic, I would say the Holy Spirit has to lead you, and you want to do it with other believers. So that's how I would answer that. How would you answer that, Yeah, no, I'm tracking totally with everything you said so far. I would add that, you know, we have a problem today that seemingly did not exist at the time that the New Testament was written, which was that we we were witnessing in in the scriptures disciples casting out demons. And there seems to be a kind of a species of Christian today that is classified as a Christian, but may not necessarily be a disciple. And so we may see lots of Christians that aren't going to participate in something like casting out demons, nor even think they can, and in fact may not be able to. So I think there's some measure of where you're at in terms of genuine discipleship with the Lord, uh, there's a totality of being given over to him that I think precedes this kind of activity that we're talking about. So um, that's the only yes. addendum I would make to that is, um, you know, the word disciple is mm. a loaded term in terms of who is doing the casting out. These are not casual, dare I say, attending a church service once a week for a few hours and then going back to their regular life for the other 148 hours a week. That's not these kind of people that we're reading about in the New Testament when they use the term disciple. So um, I think think that's a distinction that unfortunately we have to at least raise today. But yeah, I don't see any commands for this. I see an empowerment. I see even a predictive statement by the Lord that here's something Mm -hmm. to look for. Mm-hmm. For my disciples, thank God, mm-hmm. because when it's needed. And yes, it's not something that probably ought to be done in a solo way. There's, It's a pretty serious activity, and you do you need to be led by the Lord, and you need to be sure of a person that you are addressing in this capacity actually is in need of that type 
yes. of deliverance because I've seen many times people come into a situation where they're going to attempt to do this and that may not actually be what is actually at work. So there's definitely some discernment needed, Absolutely. which again comes back to the safety of a plurality of people. Yes. Um, you know, hopefully experienced people, seasoned mm. people, mature people looking at a situation and, and kind of having a collective agreement about what's going on and what needs to be done in response. I think you make a good point and I want to double click on it because in my experience and in my observation, a baby Christian or a Christian who is, for lack of a better term, barely being transformed in their walk, many areas of their life not given over to surrender to Christ, and yet they are born from above. You know, there is evidence of the new birth. Such a person can share the gospel with someone. Such a person can lead someone to the Lord. Such a person can pray. But when it comes to assaulting the spiritual realm of the demonic and the satanic, that person does not have much power at all. And it can even be a dangerous situation for them. The demonic and the satanic are not playthings, even for the Christian. We're dealing with entities that you know, are much more powerful than human beings. And so it does require the power of God to confront that world. And one of the major ingredients to being a channel of God's power is to be a crucified person, is to be dead to themselves, is to, to have the life of Christ formed into them to such a degree that the Lord can emit his power through them in that particular way. And we're talking about the casting out of demons. The other thing I'll say, and I think you've seen this before too, is that some Christians, and this a lot of this has to do with the tradition you're brought up in or that you expose yourself to, are obsessed with demons and casting out demons. And, you know, every single carnal or fleshly word or action suddenly now is a mark of demon possession. And so now with that lens most Christians are demon-possessed or demonized. And so now we have to go cast out demons out of everybody, even our fellow brothers and sisters. And I think that kind of obsession is not only unscriptural, it doesn't map to what we see in the New Testament. Not only do I think it's, it's a huge distraction from the kingdom of God, but I also think that it glorifies the devil. It gives him attention and honor where he doesn't even deserve it. In First John, when he says... I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven, you for his name's sake. So that's the awareness when you're newborn in Christ, is that your sins have been forgiven. You're basking in that reality. But then he says, um, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil oh, wow. one. Um, so you get this sense that this whole business of dealing with the evil one and his whole kingdom is the activity of spiritual, I call them spiritual teenagers. Yeah. Um, he says, I write to you young men because you're strong and you've overcome the evil one. There's this sense, there's this understanding that you have, that the Lord in you has authority over the forces of darkness and that you can be used in the deliverance of people who are under that kind of oppression. But it's not the ultimate sign of spiritual maturity. But it does seem to fall outside of the realm of, of being a spiritual babe. Right. Um, and that makes sense, right? Not everything is for every season in our Christian walk. Some things you grow into and some things you even grow beyond. I'm not saying we grow beyond doing that. If somebody's in need of deliverance, then, then they are. But as a focal point, as something that we're kind of not consumed with, but it's it's prevalent and it's prominent at certain stages of our walk with the Lord, I think is indicative of kind of where we're at in the big picture. So uh, I'm, I'm using that passage to kind of uh, mm. buttress what, yeah, that's what great. you were just saying about that spiritual babes maybe don't engage yeah. in the type of activity where you're showing um, yeah. you know, that you've defeated the evil one. That may be something just a little bit further down the yes. path, but also not the ultimate end either. That's right. Exactly. As John states very clearly as he's addressing kind of three separate 
mm. stages of Christian maturity. What was that third that one? Passage, um, to fathers. To fathers. That you have known him who is from the beginning. You've so known him. Wow. That there intimacy with the father really is, is where f- spiritual fatherhood leads to, I think we're talking about that. Knowing Amen. the Lord is really where, where that goes. But coming back to our question, so... I'm just guessing by just that, that there's not going to be a command then on every believer since we're dealing, you know, with the family of God made up of spiritual infants and, you know, spiritual toddlers and spiritual youngsters and spiritual teenagers and so on, that everybody kind of has a different role to play. Um, So, yeah, back to back to this question. (laughs) Yeah, I have another thought on it, and that is that the casting out of demons whatever level you're at spiritually is never a simple thing. And we see this in in the Gospels where the disciples of the Lord himself, these were people who lived, breathed, ate with the Lord, watched him sleep, watched him eat, watched him carry on his daily activities. They were up against a demonized person and they could not cast them out. They could not cast the demon out. And when Jesus spoke to them, and the question was, you know, why couldn't he cast them out? The Lord talked about faith, and then he also said, this kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. Some of the translations say fasting, others don't. I would go with the one that mentions fasting, because in my own experience, fasting is critical to the humbling of oneself, the dying to the flesh, that's required for the uh, emitting of spiritual power or the uh, the affecting of spiritual power and in the Lord. And so, you know, I just wanted to point that out too because with this obsession with demons and casting out demons, it's almost like you snap your fingers and the demon's gone, you know. And some of the so-called cases of deliverance, in my experience of what I've heard and seen, was no deliverance at all. Either the person was never demonized in the first place or they still were when it was all said and done. And I actually have had some cases of that in my own experience where I watched that happen. Now this person, the same person who asked the question about casting out demons via the Lord's command, says this, how would you help someone who is a Christian and has demonstrated their love and dedication to the Lord in the past, but due to severe abuse in their formative years, They have become mentally unstable and is now listening to demons, believing it is God talking to them. I know a person like this who attends a church and has asked to be ministered to, yet they continue to be deceived, behave inappropriately, and life is a struggle for them and their family. Now, I don't know exactly what kind of person this questioner is referring to, if it's just a person who has had abuse in their past and there's some deception going on in their mind about various things and so she's attributing this or he's attributing this to the voice of demons or if it's someone that has what we would call schizophrenia they're actually hearing voices in their head so I'm going to go with schizophrenia I'm going to because it sounds to me like this is what it may be and now we're talking about whether or not mental illnesses like schizophrenia are in fact a case of a person being possessed by a demon, or is it biological, is it chemical, is it something going on in the wiring of the brain? I'm going to tread on this very gingerly because I'm going to tell you that I am not dogmatic in my answer. I'll just give you my own observations. But I believe that the brain is just like any other organ in the body, like the heart or your thyroid glands, in that you could have an imbalance. You can have an imbalance in in your heart where you need to take medicine to even it out. You could have hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. And so you're imbalanced in that area. And so you need some kind of a, a medicine to balance it out. And it's the same way with the brain. We know a lot more about the brain than people in antiquity. And there are neurotransmitters that affect your behavior. Psychosis is often linked to too much dopamine in the brain and so forth. I think the question then becomes, are mental disorders like schizophrenia rooted in demonic possession or being demonized, or are they legitimate biological issues of brain chemistry? And I believe that it can be either. 
I don't believe all cases of schizophrenia are demonic possession. I just don't see evidence of that. You know, I know people who've had schizophrenia. I know people who have schizophrenia. And in the cases that I can think of, I see no evidence or no marks of the icky, vile, wicked fingerprints of demonic possession on them. However, I have had a case, at least one case, that was very dramatic, and it was true demonic possession, and the person was diagnosed with schizophrenia. But there were all sorts of markers that this was supernatural, you know. So I would say in this case, if there was a mental, a mentally unstable person that seemed to have been listening to demons, I would discern, is this a person that truly has a mental disorder, and do they need to be medicated, just like a person takes medication for heart imbalances, thyroid imbalances, well, the brain is the same way, or is there a demonic spirit at work at the root of this? And of course, it could be a combination too, you know, the devil takes illness of any kind and can use it for his own purposes or human vulnerabilities of any kind, especially when it comes to abuse, you know, bitterness and dysfunctional behaviors and so forth. It's a reaction to that. So I would seek to discern by the Holy Spirit and with other mature believers. I wouldn't just do this on my own. I would have at least one other person who had discernment and clarity on such things. And I would really try to seek to get to the bottom of what's causing this. And whatever is necessary, either in the natural realm or the supernatural realm, or both minister and serve that person as best I could. That's how I would deal with that. I would not immediately jump to the trigger of, well, it's a demon let's try to cast it out because that could be a fool's errand and you're not really addressing the root problem. Yeah, wow. Take a deep breath and jump in right to these kind of topics. The dark side of the supernatural world, we, we really have a tendency for this to want to be clear cut and so often it is not as clear cut as we would like it to be. In this situation that this person has written in about, again, we even based on the question, we still don't fully know don't all the details, so right. it's it's tough to answer. But um, you and I have talked about this already, and we both have faced situations similar to what this yeah. person wrote right. about, or at least we feel are similar. Um, you see the power of community in it in a situation like this because this is this is somewhere where you want multiple people, you want some track record, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you, you want to kind of take it from that perspective because very often it is almost impossible to tell exactly what's going on, at least initially. And it takes discernment and it, sometimes it takes some time to actually get a, get a handle on what really is going on. Uh, for me, this whole issue <clears throat> was resolved a number of years ago by a very dear brother in the country of Nepal, who was a, a, a native Nepalese national who did his, you know, basically his entire ministry within the borders of Nepal, and um, had what I can only describe as a book of Acts-like track record in terms of, you know, signs and wonders, uh, although he rarely talked about it, you would have to really mm. press him hard, and at the same time, he would need to kind of be open to it, and one night we did get him to share a little bit with us when mm -hmm. he was visiting us many, many years ago. And um, someone asked him, because he was actually in a situation where he had been imprisoned. He, he had been in prison for the gospel several times uh, in the kingdom of Nepal because it was illegal to change religions for anybody to any religion from one to another. You were automatically going to do prison time for that. Anyway, he did prison time several times over for converting people to to the Lord Jesus, but one of the times that he found himself in, in prison, they actually, um, because many of the many of the fellow prisoners were becoming Christians, they put him with the people that they considered insane. Those people they kept outside in stockades, locked up by their by their wrists, rather than in a cell, and and exposed to the weather outside, hoping that they would get sick and die. Well, he was put out there with them at some point, and. Um, he began praying for them, and one by one they began to get healed and or delivered. And as he was telling this story, somebody in the room asked him whether 
people who had, and, and the types of things that he was describing that these people were suffering from were the kinds of things that we've been talking about, and that we would call uh, schizophrenia. Some people would refer to it as demon possession. Um, and so somebody asked him for a distinction, and he said some of those people were possessed, mm -hmm. and some of those people were mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So he made that distinction. And this is, is somebody who mm -hmm. was delivering both kinds of people from their oppression. And I think that's another word we need to throw in the mix here is I think sometimes we, we kind of bound this up in either you're possessed or not possessed. And there is degrees of oppression. And some people are not possessed. Many people are not. <laughs> but they experience some type of a, an oppression uh, from which they also need to be delivered from. But Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the, the P word really can evoke strong reactions and we don't want to deal with that. Um, so we, we kind of go to the other side. You know, there seems to be two extremes on this where nothing is going on like that. It's all physical and biological right. That's right. or it's only spiritual. Yes. And mm -hmm. as nice as it would be for all that to be that clean, that is not always the case. And like you said, sometimes there is a mixture going on because the enemy likes to come in and aggravate and agitate an already, you know, difficult mm -hmm. situation. Well, it's interesting, too. When I think of demonization and I think of casting out demons and I think of praying for people who are demonized, you see examples of it in the Gospels. You see, and, and they're always dramatic. Yeah. You know, for example, if you never see Jesus walking up to somebody who's demonized, and um, they just kind of yawn, and the There's demon's no gone. The, yeah, it's the, the whole events. thing is dramatic. The deliverance is dramatic, and what's causing the possession, or at least the symptoms of it, is dramatic. You know, they're throwing themselves in the fire. They're cutting themselves. They're screaming out in the wilderness. It's clear that something has taken over this person. Now, having said all that, my point is, is that in the epistles, you never... Paul, when he's dealing with malevolent behavior, he ascribes it to the flesh. It's all about the flesh. It's all about dying to your flesh. It's all about mortifying the deeds of your body. It's never, you know, hey, guys, you need to get the demons out. You know, <laughs> you need to ask the elders of the church to pray for you to cast the demons out. You don't see that. It's not to suggest that it doesn't happen. And I guess this is the other side of it that I want to talk about from experience. I know two ministers. They're actually pastors of churches. And they're personal friends of mine. I know them well. And they love the Lord. Both of them are gifted in their own right. Both of them are surrendered to Christ. But one of them told me the story of how he had struggled with lust and pornography for years. Even after he came to the Lord. And he was at a service of some sort, and he was talking to one of the leaders of that event that was going on. And I don't remember the details of the conversation, but basically, I guess he opened up to this minister, my friend, you know, who, who was a pastor, about his problem. And the minister said, well, you have a spirit of lust, and I'm going to cast it out. And he prayed for my friend and spoke against the spirit of lust and there was a visceral dramatic reaction that my friend had now i don't remember if he screamed or he heaved or he vomited it was something along that order but it broke that lust now that's perplexing because this is a christian this is a leader in the body of christ this is a person who has the spirit of god and I don't care what you want to call it, if it's oppression or demonization or whatever, it doesn't matter. But his testimony was authentic and it was memorable. I have another friend, another pastor, and he was with a group of Christians. It was one of these prayer meetings one night. And he was just talking about how he would have these outbursts of anger, uncontrollable anger, you know, where he would almost be violent. All right. Not quite that, but close. And they laid hands on him, and uncontrollably, he began to scream out and had this heave reaction, as if something was coming out of him. And he said at that point, it broke that monumental hostility. 
Well, he still would, would get upset, but it was nothing like it used to be. Now, again, Christian, spirit-filled, follower of Jesus. He's a pastor. And I can't ignore those testimonials. I can't look at that and say, well, that doesn't fit my theology, so that doesn't really happen. Because I know these guys. These are friends of mine. So there is something to the demonic realm attaching itself to a believer in some way where it's causing some kind of a addictive behavior or a hurtful behavior. And that can be broken by the Holy Spirit and by the power of God. But again, it takes some kind of discernment. I don't think every fleshly activity is attributed to a demon. See, that's the error on the other side. It's one of those, uh, in some ways, murky topics that we all have to make our own way through because in reality, the time we're living in, there is pretty much information available on which, whichever position you want to hold. There's plenty of material to support your your preference. Um, and, you know, I find, I find my own view of these matters um, evolving a bit as time goes on. And yeah. uh, the Lord either giving a little bit more light or through somebody else or I'm reading something or it's just the right time. Um, so, I mean, by no means do I know how all of this works. And I know this, the name of Jesus is higher than any other name. Yeah, absolutely. And if we come up against these things suddenly or unexpectedly, we do have that authority Amen. to deal with these things. And, and hopefully right. we're near people who can kind of co-labor with us in, in this if, if the situation should arise. And that's the most important thing of all, whether we can adequately uh, traverse all the nuances of all this um, is a whole nother question. But the Lord is alive. All authority under heaven and earth has been given to him. And he exercises that directly and also through his saints. And um, that's a certainty yeah. that he's greater than all of the forces of darkness that we're talking about. And the rest, we're just leaning on him moment by moment to try to figure out what's happening in the situation and then what we're supposed to do, if anything. Exactly. He modeled that for us, always asking the Father, what's going on here and how do you want me to handle it? And in the same way, we do that with the Lord as he lives his life through us. And, you know, one of the marks of the breaking in of the kingdom of God is the casting out of demons. It is the overcoming of the enemy. There's no question about that. In fact, Michael Heiser and I did three episodes on this podcast. It's episodes 30, 31, and 32 on the kingdom of darkness. And we talked about Satan and we talked about demons and we talked about principalities and powers, three different entities in the kingdom of darkness, what those entities do, how they differ from each other, and then our reaction to them. And I think you had a question along one of those lines. Yeah, one of these um, questions that came in was addressed to you, obviously. You write a lot about principalities and powers and insurgents, and you did a fascinating episode on the subject with Michael Heiser on your previous podcast. I'm interested in learning more about how we are to engage the principalities and powers. Do you address this anywhere else? Yeah, the answer is yes. I wrote an article on my blog entitled Rethinking Spiritual Warfare at frankviola.org. But here's what I said in brief. We aren't to confront principalities and powers directly. And I'll just break in here and say that there are people who have whole ministries dedicated to doing that. And in my personal judgment, that is not only unscriptural, but it's dangerous. Jude and Second Peter warn us against speaking to the glorious ones, that is the fallen principalities and powers. But we wrestle with them through the following. One, living according to the gospel of the kingdom and sharing it, as this gospel takes root in people's hearts, it counts toward the fullness of the Gentiles and the reclaiming of the nations under Christ. This is one of the reasons why reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom is so important today. Two, by opting out of the world system, which is the domain of Satan. If you are still part of that system, you are under his domain, and he, along with the principalities and powers, have a measure of control over you. And three, the living witness of the ecclesia, when she is operating as a functioning priesthood under the headship of Jesus Christ, 
and I talk about how the body of Christ, when it's properly functioning, is to manifest the presence of Jesus by the ever member functioning of the body. And what that does is it shames principalities and powers. And I reference Ephesians 3, verses 10 to 11. Um, just to piggyback, I, uh, I think that if we take a look at what's going on in the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. um, clearly Michael is making his way past in some mysterious way. We don't totally understand all this, but he's dealing with the principality and power, known yep. as the Prince of Persia. Right. And um, Daniel is not in any way addressing that principality or that power. Mm -hmm. Daniel is praying, he's fasting, mm -hmm. but he's praying to God. So his address is, is directly toward God. And Daniel's prayer is instrumental, seemingly instrumental, in Michael eventually making his way through, even though there was about a three-week delay. That's right. Um, which, you know, there's, there's a lot to be educated by from just that short little passage, you know, that this isn't something that is done in a, you know, one, two-hour session. Here's Daniel going at it for, for quite some time, and Michael is uh, doing battle for, for weeks before he reaches Daniel. Yeah. So that's an indirect Absolutely. affecting of a principality or power, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. I can't imagine it being very wise to attempt to even address the various types of angelic majesties, fallen or unfallen, mm -hmm. as Jude describes, in that case, fallen, um, that we're not to revile them, we're not to Slander them. To slander them, take them on in those capacities. You know, sometimes you see preachers on TV yelling at that old devil. And That's right. I do not think that is generally a good idea. I understand we're pumped about having authority in Jesus and that Jesus is the victor and all that, but there are parameters to our behavior when it comes to how we're postured yeah. towards the, uh, the fallen spiritual realm. And I think we could use a little bit more... Humility. Humility, <laughs> wisdom, and discernment. Yeah, there you um, go. In terms of how we engage and, and not engage. Yeah, it's interesting. And I know there are people who have this whole teaching and formulation about how to pray prayers directed toward penetrating the principalities and powers. And, and certainly, I believe the intercessory prayer does move in that realm somehow, you know, and it, it's fascinating that. Prayers can be delayed because there's war in the heavenlies, especially when they touch national or international consequences. He also mentions the Prince of Greece in that same passage, Daniel 10. Uh, Second Peter echoes what Jude says about reviling the glorious one. So it, it appears twice in the New Testament, which is interesting. But if it's not in the scripture, if I, if I don't see evidence for a detailed roadmap on how to pray to where the principalities and powers are affected, then, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who is really fascinated by that kind of thing and jumps on it. Now, if someone listening is and you're bent that way, you know, I, I have no problem with that. Uh, I would just caution you to make sure that you're not violating what Jude warns against and what Second Peter warns against. One of the things I caution when when I had a conversation with Michael Heiser on the principalities and powers, is it's so easy to become obsessed with these matters because they're so mysterious and they're so fascinating. And one of the reasons that makes them so mysterious and so fascinating is because Scripture doesn't say a whole lot about them. And so that leaves a wide open gap for us to project our own imaginations and our own ideas and our own speculative thoughts about them. But at the end of the day, Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, getting to know him, following him, loving him, surrendering to him, yielding to him, and everything else will take care of itself. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Boom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would offer the conjecture that maybe one of the reasons why the scripture is relatively silent on, on the fact that we're so interested in so much more detail in this arena is because the Lord knows how easily distracted and consumed 
we could get. I mean, look at the little bit of information we do have and how far down the rabbit trail mm. many of us run with this topic. So perhaps he gave us the bare minimum of what we would need and um, because it's not to be our focal point. Exactly. Amen to that. All right. I think that's a great note to end on. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the Insurgents Podcast and give it a five-star review on iTunes. This will help others find it. Also, you can join Frank's unfiltered email list at frankviola.org and receive encouragement, challenges, and insights connected to the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, the insurgence has begun. Don't miss it.